Hi and welcome to Serena Speaks with myself Serena and today we're going to go over chapter 5 of the BNF which is infections. So I think we'll go through antibacterials first, then look into antifungals and then antivirals and take it from there. So first and foremost with this chapter, um, it is quite, it's another content heavy chapter um, it's another one of those that you really need to know um, the drug, the side effects, the counselling points um, and even the warning signs with some of the medication. So I think let's go through each class of drugs bit by bit and just summarise each one and the main key points to take home from each of them. So if we start off with the penicillins, so the penicillins can be um, categorised into three main types. You have the beta lactamase sensitive, you have the broad spectrum and you have the penicillinase resistant. So let's start off with the beta lactamase sensitive. So what does that really mean? Well, beta lactamase is an enzyme which is produced by these, um, these bacteria and it provides multi-resistance to beta lactamase antibiotics. So with some cases, um, well with some, med some penicillins, they are more sensitive to beta lactamase and they are, for example, phenoxymethyl penicillin and benzyl penicillin. Then you have your broad spectrum ones, which are your amoxicillin and ampicillin. So that's nice to remember the two A's, amoxicillin and ampicillin. And you have your penicillin, your penicillin resistant ones, which are your flucloxacillin. So penicillins in general can, are very good in gram positive and gram negative infections. And they can be given used for oral infections, otitis media, pneumonia, respiratory tract infections. And the main side effects that are associated with them are hypersensitivity, anaphylaxis and diarrhoea. So remember, some people are um, very much allergic to penicillins, so anaphylaxis. Um, another point to know is that with flucloxacillin, it's used... It, with flucloxacillin, the main side effect is it, with it is hepatic disease, especially in those that are taking it long term. So you need to look out for hepatitis, um, cholastic jaundice. Um, so those are the main side effects that are associated with, associated with flucloxacillin. Whereas with ampicillin and amoxicillin, it's usually rashes. And remember, not everybody gets side effects with medications, but those are the general ones with those specific medicines. And with flucloxacillin, ampicillin and phenoxymethylpenicillin, they should need to be taken on an empty stomach. Now, if you look at the last um, sheet in the, well, the last little, the little cardboard part on the last page of the BNF, um, it has all your recommended wording of cautionary and advisory, advisory labels. And specifically with flucloxacillin, ampicillin, phenoxymethylpenicillin, because they need to be taken on an empty stomach, that, what that means is it needs to be one hour before food or two hours after food. And it's really important with this chapter that you know those cautionary labels. And with um, antibiotics in general, those three are really the only ones that are taken before food. Um, the only two that are really taken after food are nitrofurotoin and metronidazole, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail later on. But in terms of the four foods, just your flucloxacillin, ampicillin and your phenoxymethylpenicillin. So moving on to cephalosporins, um, so they come in different generations. You have the first, second, third, fourth and fifth generation. And it is a good idea to learn a few examples of them. So, for example, your first generation um, cephalexin, second generation cephachlor. Um, I'm not going to lie to you. They are horrible to learn because they all begin with the letter C. So that just makes things even more confusing. But it is good to know, even if it's just a couple of examples of each, that way, if they're really mean in the exam and they put a question in there and they say which of these is a second generation, at least then you'll be a bit more prepared for it. Um, yeah, they're not nice to learn. Um, but with cephalosporins, they can be usually used in pneumonia, meningitis, um, urinary tract infections, and the main side effects with them are antibiotic associated colitis. And a little fun fact, um, 
is that 0.5 to 6% of patients that are allergic to penicillins usually have a hypersensitivity reaction towards cephalosporins. So that's something to be aware of as well. So now if we go on to our tetracyclines. So tetracyclines is quite a chunky one in terms of the cautionary advice and labels um, that need to be given and counselling points that need to be given to a patient. So tetracycline is a group, but you also have a drug called tetracycline. Why they want to confuse us like that, I don't know. But the broad um, spectrum tetracyclines are, for example, doxycycline, tetracycline the drug, and limocycline. And doxycycline usually has a long duration of action, so it only needs to be given once a day. Um, now, a really important thing to remember with um, these tetracyclines, the group tetracyclines, is that they're not for under 12 year olds, they are not for a person who's pregnant, and not for a person who's breastfeeding, because the tetracyclines can deposit into growing teeth and bones, so not for under 12 year olds. And they can be used for acne, rosacea, chlamydia. And like I mentioned, this tetracycline is a key one to remember with your cautionary labels. And um, with exams, they like to give different scenarios and then you have to decide whether that person needs to be referred, whether they need to stop taking the medita medicine, whether it's safe for them to continue taking the medicine, or even that you can give them an over-the-counter preparation. Um, so, for example, they could say patient A comes in and they have a headache, so they want something over the counter for their headache. On further questioning, you find out that they're taking limocycline for their acne. What would be the next appropriate mode of action? And the answer would be that they need to stop taking the medicine. Because if a person develops any headaches or visual disturbances whilst they're taking tetracycline, they need to be stopped. And it's little things like that where they like to catch you up on an exam. Another example is, um, your, I want you to look at cautionary label number six and seven. So number six says, do not take any indigestion remedies or any preparations take, that contain iron or zinc um, two hours before or after this medicine. Cautionary number seven says the exact same thing, but has the little word milk in there. So do not take any milk, indigestion remedies or preparations containing iron or zinc two hours um, before or after this medicine. Now, some of your tetracyclines are fine to take with milk. Some of your tetracyclines are not fine to take with milk. And again, that little word milk is where they like to try and chip you up on and try and catch you out. So the ones to remember that you can take with milk and it's safe to take with milk is remember the acronym does like milk. So DLM, so doxycycline, limocycline, aminocycline, does like milk. And those to remember that you can't take milk with them, remember DOT, I can never pronounce this one. So it's demi, demeclocycline, demeclocycline, oxytetracycline, and tetracycline. You can't take the milk. As a side note, ciprofloxacin is also one that shouldn't be taken with milk. So you can remember as C dot, but as we're focusing on tetracyclines for now, dot, demeclocycline, oxytetracycline, tetracycline, don't take with milk. And like I said in an exam, they could easily say, match these cautionary labels to these tetracyclines and you might have tetracycline there and you might have or oxytetracycline there and you have doxycycline and the cautionary label says milk one doesn't say milk so you really need to know which ones are associated with which antibiotic um, also with doxycycline you need to protect the skin from any sunlight and um, you need to take with plenty of water because it can cause um, esophageal irritation so that's the tetracyclines. So moving on to aminoglycosides. So for example, gentamicin, streptomycin, neomycin, um, so your mycins. Um, streptomycin though is usually reserved only for patients that have TB. Um, and gentamicin is one of our high risk medicines. So remember with our high risk medicines, we need to be a bit more cautious with them, um, monitor, monitor them a little bit more. Um, so aminoglycosides in general, they're bactericidal and they're given by injection because they're not absorbed very well in the gut. And the main side effects, um, particularly with gentamicin, is ototoxicity and nephrotoxicity. 
So the patient needs to be aware of any partial hearing loss or vertigo, which would indicate ototoxicity, or any dehydration, confusion, nausea, vomiting, which would indicate nephrotoxicity. And they're excreted renally, hence that risk of nephrotoxicity, and um, they're cautioning patients with renal impairment. So with this in mind, what we would need to measure, what we need to monitor is their serum um, their serum concentration, their renal concentration, and their creatinine clearance should be measured before giving the drug. And if their plasma concentration starts to go really high, then the way to overcome that is that their dose interval would need to be increased. So this is just me making it up. Say you were giving the drug every four hours, then they would, might need to be given it every six hours, for example. So you want it, so you don't stop giving the drug, um, if the concentration is high, you just want to increase that interval so that their plasma concentration, it might be really high up, so then it just starts going back to the normal level that it should be. Um, so increase their dose interval. Moving on to macrolids. So macrolids are our erythromycin, clarithromycin, azithromycin, and they're usually the alternative that is given to patients who are penicillin, penicillin allergic. Um, they can be used in campylobacter infections, chlamydia, skin infections. In terms of chlamydia, the um, drug that would be given is azithromycin. That can be sold over the counter for um, if certain conditions are met. And remember, we need to know which medicines can be given over the counter in certain situations. So if a person is over 16 years old and um, and they've had they've had the test done and they and it's confirmed that they have chlamydia, then you can give them azithromycin. You can also give them azithromycin for the potential sexual partners that they've had um, in case they caught chlamydia from them or if they gave them chlamydia. And you can only give a maximum of one gram as a single dose. Um, and because it has a long half-life, that one dose is, is sufficient for them. Whereas something like clarithromycin, that's usually given twice a day. And we know if it's twice a day, then it needs to be given 12 hours apart. So 9 a.m., 9 p.m. Um, main side effects with them are associated with GI side effects. So nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, can even get a rash. And there is a risk of hepatotoxicity. And their main interaction is with statins. So if a person is on, say, for example, simvastatin, but they need to be given, they've now been given clarithromycin, they need to stop taking the simvastatin whilst they're on the clarithromycin. And with erythromycin, again, they can ask one of those situations where they give you a scenario and you have to decide where the patient needs to be referred, or whether you can give them an over-the-counter preparation, or whether it's safe for them to continue taking the medicine. And an example is with erythromycin. Erythromycin causes severe nausea. So they might say to you, they might present a case with patient B. And like I said, they've got nausea. They've been taking erythromycin. What would be the best course of action for them? And actually, in this situation, it is safe for the person to take to keep taking the erythromycin. So whilst they might have this really horrible side effect of severe nausea, it is in fact safe for them to continue taking the medicine. So you might just need to reassure them of that. So moving on to lincosamides. So our example of our lincosamide is clindamycin. And clindamycin can be used for gram positive cocci, for staphylococcal infections, joint and bone infections, cellulitis. And why it's so good in bone infections, for example, osteomyelitis, is that it concentrates into the bones. Um, so yeah, it's very effective for bone infections. Um, however, it should not be used in patients who have a history di of diarrhea. And if a patient develops diarrhea whilst they're taking clindamycin, they need to stop taking the medicine because this could indicate that they have antibiotic associated colitis. So with our tetracyclines, if you develop any visual disturbances or headaches, then you stop taking the medicine. With our macrolids, with our erythromycin, if a person develops severe nausea, it's fine for them to carry on. With our clindamycin, if they develop um, diarrhea, stop taking. And you would need to monitor their kidney and well, their hepatic and renal function. 
So moving on to diaminopyrimidines and sulfonamides. So examples are trimethoprim and cotrimoxazole. So these can be used for urinary tract infections, even for respiratory infections, um, shingalosis. And their main side effect is Stephen Johnson syndrome. And again, know the signs and symptoms, be aware of signs and symptoms of Stephen Johnson syndrome. They can also cause blood disorders and bone marrow suppressions. So if a person develops any bleeding or bruising whilst they're taking the trimethoprim, they need to be referred. Um, you want to monitor their blood count, especially in patients who are taking long-term therapy, and they need to maintain an adequate fluid intake. Um, and trimethoprim should be avoided in pregnancy, particularly in the first trimester. So first trimester, trimethoprim is a no-no. So moving on to um, anti-TB medication. Now, TB, anti-TB medication is probably one of the easiest sections to get your head around. Um, so first things first, there's two main phases. There's the initial phase and the continuation phase. Now, with the initial phase, um, it's four medicines that are given. And the best way to remember it is through RIPE. So you have rifampicin, isoniazide, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol. Now, RIP, RIP, comes as a combination product called Rifita. And these, all of these three are hepatically metabolized, whereas ethambutol is renally metabolized. During the continuation phase, you only use two drugs. You use rifampicin and isoniazide, so RI, and it comes in a combination called Rifina. So we had Rifita and Rifina. And the best way to remember it is that in the initial phase, you have four medicines which are used for two months, and it's the opposite on the continuation phase. You use two medicines for four months. So that's quite nice and easy to remember. And even the monitoring um, side of things is easy to remember with these medications. Because if you think about it logically, if these are hepatically metabolized, then one of your monitoring points is going to be um, hepatic function. If ethambutol is renally metabolized, your second one that you need to monitor is renal function. So when we say hepatic function, you want to look out for any jaundice, any fever, vomiting, um, and you also want to measure the plasma drug concentration as well. So that needs to be monitored. Now with Rifina in particular, it can cause um, an orangey kind of discoloration to fluids. So for example, in your tears, your urine. So patients that wear contact lenses, they should try and avoid it if they're on this medication, if they're on Rifina, because it can stain them orange. And with ethambutol, E for ethambutol, E for eyes. So you need to make sure they get their eyes tested as well. And that's usually with used using a Snellen test. So you know when you go to the opticians and you have like the big letter at the top and then it goes smaller, 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 smaller letters, that's called a Snellen test. So that's how you would measure um, the patient's eyesight, monitor their eyesight with a patient that's on ethambutol. Another key thing to remember is that rimfampicin is a massive enzyme inducer, so it interacts with a lot of medicine. And um, with these medicines, particularly with patients on isoniazide, they're at risk of developing peripheral neuropathy. So the way to overcome this is to give them um, pyridoxine 10 milligrams once a day to try and prevent that peripheral neuropathy that they might get because of the isoniazide. And that's your anti-TB medication. So, so easy. Initial phase, continuation phase. Initial phase, four medicines for two months. Continuation phase, two medicines for four months. Simple. So just to mention that, I will put that poster up on the Facebook page um, so that you can have a clearer look at it. So moving on to urinary tract infections. So for a urinary tract infection, you can give nitrofurotoin, um, trimethoprim or moxicillin, and usually for three to seven days. Um, focusing on nitrofurotoin, it should be given after food and it can discolour urine, so that's something to be aware of when um, counselling your patients that are on it. Um, you want to avoid nitrofurotoin though when a pregnant person is at term in their pregnancy. So what at term means is essentially when they're about to give birth, when they're about to pop, you want to avoid nitrofurotoin then. Um, side effects include nausea, hypersensitivity and you want to monitor their hepatic function. Now, whilst urinary tract infections are very common in females, if a male, um, an under three-year-old or a pregnant person develops a urinary tract infection, then samples from them will need to be taken. Whereas for an adult female, 
usually um, usually in females in general, a, a sample wouldn't be wouldn't be necessary. So metronidazole, let's go on to then. Now metronidazole can be used. Uh, metronidazole comes in ver in various forms. It comes as a tablet, as topical preparations, and the different forms it comes in it can give an indication to what it's being used for. So, for example, in topical form, it's used for rosacea. Orally, it can be used for a C. difficile infection. And if it's given IV, it can be used for tetanus. Um, it can also be used for bacterial vaginosis, for oral infections, and be used in combination for um, if a person develops a H. pylori infection. Now, metronidazole, as I mentioned earlier in the video, needs to be given after food. And alcohol needs to be avoided because a person can develop from like reactions with metronidazole. So um, if they take metronidazole and alcohol, so for example, flushing, palpitations, nausea and vomiting. So no alcohol and no even alcohol containing mouthwashes. Try and avoid them as well. Um, you also have something called tinidazole and that has a longer duration of action. So that's only usually necessary for once a day. So let's go on to quinolones. So for example, ciprofloxacin, ophiloxacin, and they can be used for gonorrhea, um, respiratory tract infections, urinary tract infections, and even gastrointestinal infections. So a main side effect with um, these quinolones is convulsions, particularly with patients that are taking NSAIDs. So NSAIDs, ciprofloxacin, massive interaction, um, Ciprofloxacillins need to be avoided if a person is on a long-term NSAID, for example, if they're taking aspirin every day, um, because of that risk of convulsions. Another rare side effect is tendon damage, and that can usually develop 48 hours after taking um, ciprofloxacin. And a person needs to also avoid sunlight if they're taking ciprofloxacin and needs to be avoided in pregnancy. Um, with quinolones, there are many cautions. Um, so, for example, epileptics, a person with G6 PD deficiency, myasthenia gravis, and even children, they're all cautioned in, in, in patients that are needing to take quinolones. So, let's talk about glycopeptides. For example, TCO planin, and that's usually given once a day, and vancomycin. And vancomycin is, again, one of our high risk drugs. So, the Therapeutic range trough level is usually should be usually between 10 to 15 milligrams per litre and a loading dose is usually required. Um, it's usually twice a day that it's given and it's important to measure the creatinine clearance pre-dose. Now it can be used for endocarditis, endocarditis even. For endocarditis it can be used for C. difficile infections and the main side effects with vancomycin, similar to gentamicin, but remember they're, they're two different classes, um, is ototoxicity and nephrotoxicity. So it shouldn't be used in a person with a history of deafness. And um, another, another um, side effect of um, vancomycin is something called red man syndrome, which is when they get this flushing of the skin. There's even a risk of hypertension or anaphylaxis if it's administered too quickly. And a patient needs to be watching out for any um, signs of blood disorders. So any unexplained bruising or bleeding, any sore throats. Um, and so it'd be important to monitor their blood count, their renal function, their um, liver function, and even their auditory function, so their hearing, because of that risk of ototoxicity. So if we talk briefly about linazolid, so it's a non-selective mal, and as we know with our mouths, we need to avoid any tyramine-rich foods. Main side effects with them are nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, but they can be associated with optic neuropathy. So a patient needs to report any blurred vision and um, they can be used for pneumonia and MRSA. So now um, let's talk about antileprotic drugs, so drugs that use leprosy, and they're mainly dapsone, um, rif rifampicin and clofazamine, and all three are usually used for multibacillary leprosy for two years. Now there are many other antibacterials out there, I'm not going to go through each one of those, but just to make you aware, so for example chlorophenicol, so you know it can come as an ointment, it can come as drops um, for the eye, it can also be used, it can also come as tablets and be used systemically, but it has um, 
It's associated with a haematological side effect, so it's very rarely used now systemically. Um, it's only used in very severe cases. Also have fusidic acid, and that's usually given with another antibiotic to prevent any resistance. You also have um, rifaximin, rifaximin, rifax, I hate these words, rifaximin, and that can be used for traveller's diarrhoea, and fidoxamicin, and that can be used also for C. difficile infections. So just to summarise antibacterials, as you can see from my beautiful drawing, I'm clearly an artist, I didn't even bother attempting to draw feet because it just would have been embarrassing. Like, this is embarrassing enough, but me trying to draw feet would just be another level. Um, so the best way to remember antibacterials or to make a summary of antibacterials is draw a silhouette of a body and then write down um, or associate each part of the body with a different antibiotic. So if we start off with the skin on my little happy chappy here. So skin, you want to think rosacea, acne, so it'll be tetracyclines that are given. If a person has a skin infection, then flucloxacillin will be given. You want to think of the mouth, so for oral, orally, so you could give metronidazole, give amoxicillin. With the upper respiratory tract infections, so um, a penicillin might be given, um, amoxicillin, a macrolid, uh, even coamoxiclav could be given. Then you want to move on to the stomach. So when it comes to the stomach, think H. pylori, so a metronidazole, amoxicillin, um, clarithromycin. When you think of the gut, particularly the lower gut, um, try and think of C. difficile, so be metronidazole, that could be given for that. With a urinary tract infection, amoxicillin, nitrofurotoin, trimethoprim, um, even cephalexin can also be given. Um, with bacteria, genital infection, um, azithromycin, even doxycycline, metronidazole, they can all be given. And some um, diabetics get something called a diabetic foot. Clindamycin can be used for that. It's rarely used now, but it's just something to be aware of. So embarrassingly, I will put this up on the Facebook page because I think it will help. Um, of course, if you don't want to use this, I don't blame you. But draw out a silhouette and just associate each area, each region with what antibacterial can be used for that different body part. Because um, that's a nice, very quick easy sort of way to remind yourself of what different medications is used for what different sections. So we've done antibacterials, so let's look at antifungals. And antifungals is quite a funny one to sort of learn, I think, textbook reading wise, because in terms of the exam, they want you to be able to look at a picture of, say, ringworm and know that, that is ringworm um, and not confuse it, for example, with roundworm. They might show you a picture of tinea pedis and you need to know, oh, yeah, that's athlete's foot. And then know when you can, when you're eligible to give something over the counter. So, for example, tavinafine or brand name Lamisil. Or if they're more than three toes are affected, then they need to be referred onwards. They'll want you to know what um, tinea corpus, so when ringworm is on the body, what that looks like, um, know that tinea capitis is, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but that that is a fungal scalp infection. Um, also with fungal scalp infections, you can give ketoconazole. Again, that can be given over the counter. Um, see, it's a funny one to sort of learn textbook wise. I think it's a better one to try and learn through looking at pictures and trying to identify and differentiate what different infections look like based on those different images. Um, but with antifungals, just in general, you have, for example, your imidazoles, you have your um, triazoles. So, for example, your triazoles are fluconazole, itraconazole. So fluconazole is usually in a tablet form, which it can be given um, by mouth. Um, itraconazole should be used in caution in patients with hepatic impairment. And um, they are very effective in fungal nail infections. You also have your imidazole antifungals. So, for example, clotrimazole, ketoconazole. So, clotrimazole can be used for vaginal candidiasis. Um, it's also worth noting that you can also get oral candidiasis, like we know with our bronchodilators. But they, looking at more intervaginal candidiasis, so vaginal thrush, um, it's important to know 
because a lot of these products will be you will be able to give them over the counter but you need to know in what situations you're legally allowed to give them over the counter what age restrictions there may be in what situations you can so with vaginal candidiasis clotrimazole it comes as a cream it can come as a pessary and um, a person can obviously be take it over the counter However, if they've had or they present with vaginal thrush more than twice in the last six months, then they need to be referred onwards. So it's little details like that, knowing which situations you can give certain products in is, is what is really key to knowing not only this exam, but to being a pharmacist. Um, you also get some really fancy named ones, so your poly, polyline antifungals, so amphotericin, nystatin. Nystatin is usually used for any perioral um, lesions or oral or oropharyngeal lesions in the mouth, and it's very effective in that. Um, a side effect with these poly, polyline antifungals, though, can be nephrotoxicity, so that's something to be aware of. Um, other antifungals include tabinafine, which we mentioned before, and that's usually the drug of choice with ringworm or even with nail fungal infections. Um, you also get something called flu cytosine, um, but a side effect of that is bone marrow suppression. So I think have a read of it in the BNF, have a look at your antifungals, but like I said, the best way of learning antifungal medication, first and foremost would be if you're in a community pharmacy, then go out onto the shop floor, see what different products are out there for antifungal, um, uh, see what antifungal preparations there are available to the public, and then try and learn in which situations with which age exemptions you can give these. Um, have a read of the patient information leaflet as well. That would be quite, quite useful too. So that's what I'm going to go into with antifungals. Um, now briefly on to antivirals, so HIV as an example, so that as of yet there's no cure for the disease, but we can try and slow down disease progression through different classes of drugs. For example, protease inhibitors, non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, um, integrase inhibitors, and with um, there's also an, um, with, these are all antiretrovirals, and with these classes there come some very wonderfully sounding different examples of drugs that fall into these classes. So again, it's good to just know, like with the cephalosporins, it's good to know a few of them as examples. Um, the main side effects with antiretrovirals is lipodystrophy syndrome. So lipodystrophy symptom, syndrome is um, metabolic effects that are associated with antiretroviral infections. And these can include, for example, fat um, redistribution, insulin resistance, dyslipidemia. And so the main advice that you would give would be on lifestyle changes. So to try and avoid any or prevent any cardiovascular risk. And you want to monitor plasma, lipid and blood glucose levels before treatment, three to six months during treatment and then annually. So another example of viral infections are our herpes virus infections. So there's herpes simplex. Now herpes simplex can be categorised into two subtypes. You have HSV1 and HSV2. HSV1 is more associated with the mouth and the eyes and usually topical antiretroviral, um, sorry, topical antiviral is um, sufficient for these, um, in for those that have HSV1. Those that have HSV2, those are genital infections and you would give an oral antiviral instead. Um, you also have herpes zoster, which is shingles. And shingles, you wanna start treatment within 72 hours and treatment usually lasts within seven to 10, hours, ten, seven to ten days, usually treatment lasts. Um, you also have a cyclovir, which can be used as an ointment or orally. You have famcyclovir, valacyclovir. Then you have varicella zoster infection. So for the varicella zoster infection, that's just a fancy name for um, chin box. And usually if a person is between one month and 12 years old, then 
you don't really need to give an antiviral. You would just give symptomatic treatment. So calamine lotion um, might give paracetamol if they have um, a fever. But if they fall outside of this, so if they're a neonate, if they are an adolescent or an adult, then you would give an antiviral. And again, with um, chicken pox, with shingles, you will need, with even like measles, um, rubella, you will need to be able to um, differentiate between each infection, skin infection um, based either on a picture or on the wording that they use. So if it's a shingles infection, usually the giveaway terms um, that they will use are, is that it's a sharp stabbing pain in one side of the body. So that sharp stabbing and one side of the body, that usually indicates a shingles. If they say it's a white pus filled like um, spot all over the body, that will be chickenpox. And if they mention the word coplic spot, that would then be measles. So I, they might just like to show you a picture and then from the picture you need to differentiate between measles, rubella, shingles, chickenpox, um, germ measles, or it might be that they use these specific terms like coplic spot, like sharp stabbing pain on one side that radiates to the front of the stomach, for example, um, and through the wording, then you need to differentiate which skin infection it is. Um, you can also get viral hepatitis, for example, chronic hepatitis B, chronic hepatitis C. Um, so for hepatitis B, again, some wonderfully sounding medication that will be given for that. So tenofovir, um, entecovir. If it's hepatitis C, then you use a combination of ribavirin and Peg into Ferron Alpha. Lovely names. Moving on to influenza. So it is flu season at the moment, and I'm sure you've seen the adverts, the posters, probably in your own pharmacy. Um, so, you, so you need to know which patients need to be targeted with the flu vaccine. So that's patients that have um, a cardiac, um, that have cardiac disease, hepatic, renal disease, over 65 year olds and diabetics. Um, it can be used in a person who's pregnant and breastfeeding, but you need to look at the benefit to risk ratio. Um, and you can give prophylaxis when influenza is circulating in the community. Um, or if a um, person has been in close contact with someone who is suffering from influenza. So if we look at antimalarials, I actually think the best way to learn antimalarials is through the patient information leaflets of for example, Malarone, um, Riomet, um, because with a lot of them, they will, even with a lot of the, the, the drug tablets, they will specify which ones need to be taken in the day, which ones need to be taken at night time, which ones need to be taken once a week, which ones need to be taken daily. And it's probably an easier way to learning it rather than trying to learn it text wise in the BNF. Um, but briefly, if a person is pregnant and they're going to is out of their control to go into a malaria area, um, malaria area, then um, quinine would be their first choice of medication of anti-malarial, um, followed by clindamycin. Um, and you have falciparum and non-falciparum malaria. So if a person has um, falciparum malaria, then usually the drug of choice would be malarone, which is the brand name for proganil with atovaquone. You can, they can also use Riamet, they can use quinine. With treatment for non-pat falciparum malaria, it's usually chloroquine. If um, for prophylaxis of falciparum malaria, it'll be malarone. And for prophylaxis of malaria, or a risk of a chlor chloroquine resistance is low, well, if chloroquine, can't even speak, if chloroquine resistance is low, Therefore, drug of choice would be chloroquine, quite logical. Whereas in an area where chloroquine resistance is high, then um, the drug of choice would be either mefloquine or doxycycline. So prophylaxis for malaria needs to be considered for, based on patient factors, side effects, risk of exposure, drug resistance, and additional advice that can be given to a person who's going to an area which is high um, with malaria is, for example, to use DEET sprays or the lotions or roll-ons, to use um, mosquito nets which are impregnated with permethrin, 
to use mats and vaporised insecticides and to try and wear long sleeved um, t-shirts and long sleeved trousers when they're out and about to try and protect them against bites. So then the BNF goes into more specialised and specific um, conditions and the drugs that can be used with them. I'm not going to bore you by reading them out to you, it's, it's quite clearly written in there. For example, um, amniobicides, where you can use metronidazole or tenidazole, and it just goes through quite a few of them, a um, few specific conditions and the medication that can be used against that. So instead, I'm going to go on to antithalmitic drugs. So antithalmitic drugs are, for example, your threadworms, your roundworms, um, tapeworm, hookworm. And as I mentioned before, it's important to be aware of what they look like um, so you are able to differentiate them in an exam. So something like threadworms. So threadworms, if one person has it, you need to treat all the members of the family, even if another one, another pa person in the family isn't showing any symptoms of having threadworms, it's important to treat all members of the family. They need to wash their hands and nails thoroughly, especially after going to the toilet. And they need to take a bath immediately after waking up, after rising, um, to try and get rid of and remove any ova that have been laid during the night time. And the medication of choice would be mebendazole. That can only be used for over two year olds and it's a single dose. And only if necessary, you would give a second dose um, two weeks later. So some people, and sometimes I try and trip you up in the exam, some people think that, oh, you take one dose, come back in two weeks for your second dose. You don't really need the second dose unless, unless it's necessary, unless they're still showing symptoms, then you would give the second dose. Otherwise, that first dose is usually sufficient. Then you have roundworm infections. The fancy word for that is ascaricides. Caricides. So roundworm infections, again, be aware of what they look like. And treatment for that would again be mebendazole, but it'd be 100 milligrams twice a day for three days. And the same goes with hookworm. Hookworm, you'd give mebendazole 100 milligrams twice a day for three days. And they usually live in the upper part of the small intestine, and they can cause a person to have anemia because they suck on their blood, which is delightful. Um, and there's also tapeworm. Um, a lot of the medication for tapeworm is either unlicensed or it would be surgical tapeworm depending on the state of their disease. Um, but yeah, for the threadworms, for roundworms, for hookworms, it's mebentazole. So that's chapter five of the BNF. So I think the main takeaway points of this, particularly with the antibacterial side of it, is to know your drugs, know your drug classes, and specifically know which cautionary labels and advisory labels are with each ones, and which situations it's fine to continue with medicine, and in which situations they need to stop and be referred. Um, because those are typical questions that they like to ask in an exam. So I hope you liked this video. If you did, why not give it a thumbs up? Um, why not share it with all your other pharmacy buddies or anyone else that you think might be interested in this video? And subscribe too and visit our Facebook page. And like I mentioned, my beautiful A-star drawings will be on there. So until next time, happy revisings.